This is Movers and Shakers, where we interview the upcoming generation of make it happen multifamily investors to share their story. Welcome to the Movers and Shakers podcast. My name is Gino Barbaro, co-founder of Jake and Gino, multifamily investor, educator, father, mentor, and I am joined by my co-host who's still got great looking hair, my broseph, Josh Rusin, community director here at Jake and Gino. Josh? You're looking good. End of the day, you're still, still keeping it on there. How you doing, bro? Making it happen, Gino. Super excited to connect with you here. Uh, even more excited about today's guest. How are you doing, Gino? Doing good. Just got back from a bike ride. I, I you know, I want to don't never take the phone with me. And the only time I take the phone with me, who FaceTimes me? Joshua. It was great. Nice little bike ride. Got the phone. Sophia's like, why is, why are you pick up the phone? I say I pick up the phone for two people, for Josh and for my wife. The only, only two people I'll pick up the phone for. So doing good. How are you? There you go. Doing good, man. I like it. Made the inner circle. So speaking of today's guest, we have Jared Glant. A little bit about Jared. He's the president of Cardone Enterprises. He's actually been with Grant for over a decade. The co-host of Young Hustlers podcast. And he's an investor in Cardone Capital and the Hundy app. Welcome to the show, Jared. Hey, it's great to be here. I appreciate you guys having me on. Yes. All right, Jared. So I want to dive a little bit into your background. I know at the age of 21, you had a very strong six-figure income. You were selling print and online advertisements you know, you scaled up very quickly at a young age, kind of what were the keys to some of that early success in your career? Uh, well, that's a great question. So I, I talk about this um, a lot, actually, because I had been a product of what I call personality based sales success. So somebody who gets in a job, uh, because they have a sales job, because they have a great personality, and the personality is literally the thing that uh, creates the success that they have. But the fundamentals are out, the tactics are out, the strategy is out. And so you end up getting by because you're good with people. And, and so I, I didn't really, I'd say people, I, I made, you know, almost 200 grand at 21 uh, in sales, but I really didn't learn how to become a salesperson until I came and worked for Grant. And uh, so that happened at 26. And that's when I was like, oh my gosh, if I would have just known all of this material when I was 18, uh, you know, I'd be the one. It'd be uh, Jared Glant Capital. You know? Yeah, Jared, to, be, to piggyback off of that, I think that's what led to your success because most people learn the strategies and the tactics and don't have the personality and don't love what they're selling. So you need to have both. I think in my perspective, I'm, I'm a lot older than you. I'm not really that great at sales until I met Josh, but I always love my products. But you need to marry both of them, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, I think that I think that people rely too much on personality. I don't think that you need to, you know, there's this whole thing that like people buy from people that they trust and that they love. And I mean, do people make decisions when you give them the information that they want and you're a professional about it? And so mm -hmm. if I do that with a lot of energy and, and uh, you know, a sharp suit and a big watch or whatever, uh, or somebody else does it and in a different way, but gets me exactly what I want, maybe even more efficiently or, or uh, they're, they're more complete with the experience that I have with them. Um, you know, I think personality is a, is a nice to have, but it's not a need to have. So what were the, I guess, give me a couple of big takeaways from um, the sales, from what you learned from Grant when you, when you got on board that really elevated your ability to, to I guess, earn more money. Yeah, uh, for me, the, 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 the first big one was learning how to go out and just create from nothing. So I, I, worked in a, uh, I worked in ad sales. I had a territory and uh, it was pretty established. You know, like our product had like 90% penetration in the marketplace. Almost everybody who was a target had it. So you were really almost like managing relationships um, and managing your book of business. But what I learned when I came to work for Grant was how important prospecting is. Uh, you know, it, you know, pre previous to my advertising sales days, you know, I worked in retail. I sold motorcycles and jet skis and did all that because my dad was in that business. Um, and everybody always liked to brag about how strong of a closer that they were. And and then when I came to work for Grant, and I was like, so I've got no leads. I've got no, uh, uh, b uh, barely a website. Uh, I have to go and figure out who I'm going to call. I've got to create a script. I've got to get past the gatekeeper. I've got to get in front of them and be compelling enough in about 18 seconds 
to get them to not hang up on me and listen to what I have to say. Uh, like that is when you become a professional salesperson. When you can do that and you can master that, that was literally the most freeing skill I ever learned in my life because I know now that no matter what product I have, I can get in front of the people I need to get in front of because I know how to do it. So, and so it's very, it's very empowering uh, as a salesperson to, to do that. How does that translate into multifamily? Well, for, for me, uh, I just invest, you know, I, I, you know, if you're, if you're looking at it, getting deals, uh, who's the person you need to get in front of? Like if you're trying to, to figure out, uh, how to take a deal down, who the, you know, who the owner of a certain property is, if you're trying to figure out how to get a bank to give you money, like you have to be able to go and with, they don't know who you are. Uh, you know, unless you're like Grant and you have a big portfolio and lots of relationships, they don't know who you are. You got to get their attention the same way I got to get their attention to go in and sell them some sales training. So, um, the ability as an entrepreneur, as a business person, the ability to create something out of nothing in the form of interest, uh, is the most powerful skill that you can have. Jared, I want to piggyback to your story. So you mentioned at 21, you're making 200 grand a year, 26, you start working for Grant. Bring me the in-between time there. I know that kind of the territory and where yeah. you're working started shrinking, yeah. you know, fill well, in that no, gap. No, no, no. I blew it up. And so corporate redeployed the territory. They cut my territory into three. And so I said, I'm out of here. That's not cool. They weren't willing to, to do anything to keep me around. Uh, so I was like, I, I, I quit. I went back to school. And, um, you know, at the time I had a bunch of money packed away. Um, but I also had just turned 21. And, you know, when you're 21 and you make, a lot of money and you still live at home, you go to the club and you pop bottles and you blow all your money and you hang out with people you shouldn't hang out with and you do things you're not supposed to do and then you make bad decisions and then you end up on unemployment. So then I ended up on unemployment. Uh, I was doing drugs, like, you know, kind of had like this fall from grace and then uh, moved, ended up moving to Austin for about two years uh, when my dad got a job out there just to kind of get out of the the spot that I was in because I went from doing really well. Everybody's like, how are you doing so well? So young to dude, you're a total freaking loser. And so then I had to go, uh, I need to get out of this situation, this environment because it's not productive for me. Moved out there two years uh, in Austin working for my dad, just getting my life back together and then moved back to California and then had, had a job with Grant six months later. How'd you find Grant? What attracted you there and how'd you get your foot in the door? When I first moved back to San Diego, um, away from Austin, I was, I was working for a buddy of mine and just didn't like the job. Still one of my best friends, he was my best man at my wedding, but just did, his job was not for me. And uh, I was not happy, communicated this to my dad. My dad sent me a video, he was like, hey, I just bought some, uh, some sales programs for the team from this guy, here's a YouTube video, check him out. And so I went on YouTube and at the time Grant had about, this is 2010. So if you go back in time on his YouTube channel, you can find out like how many videos he had on his YouTube channel. But I think there were like 25 or 30 or something. So I watched every video he had on YouTube and I was like, this is the guy. I got to go, I got to go find a way to, to work with him because he reinvigorated and re-inspired something in me that, that got me, uh, uh, thinking about my potential again, rather than just where I was at. And, and then he gave me the, the, the skills that he communicated in such a, a simple way, gave me confidence to be able to, uh, to achieve levels much greater than I ever thought possible for myself. So then I actually employed his own tactics on him to try to get the job. So, you know, I called every, I called the office every day for about a month until I got, got through and got an interview. So everybody knew me in the office. There was, you know, four or five employees at the time uh, and they all knew me and I all, and I knew every single one of them. So, Dude, I love that persistence. So let's talk about that. I, I know your first career job with Grant was more of an administrative role. What changes did you make within yourself when you got around that culture of like-minded individuals? And then what were your keys to success going from that to sales, to sales manager, to VP, to president? Yeah, well, uh, so I got hired as a salesperson, but really like I was front desk. I ended up answering the phone a lot um, and figuring out how to cold call. But like, uh, again, like at this time, there were four employees. Uh, there was a web guy. Uh, a shipping person, an assistant, an accounting person. Like that was it. 
Like there wasn't, we have 155 employees today. Like there wasn't, we didn't have the, the thing back then that we did today. And Grant wasn't around. He officed out of his house at the time. We had just moved into an office. So, um, so I didn't have, I, I, what I had was I had Cardone University. Like that was the thing that I just like sunk my teeth into and was like, if it was important enough for this guy who's super successful already, I didn't know this because it was because of the real estate and uh, that was where his big money was at. Um, but if it was important enough for this guy to put on video and package up like this, then it's probably worth me spending every ounce of time that I'm not in front of a customer in this thing, trying to get inside his head, figure out how he thinks and figure out how to make all this stuff work and use it on customers. Yeah, so, so that was that. my mentor. Cardone University was my mentor. Grant didn't even know my name probably for the first six months that I worked there. So going from four employees to now nine years later, 150, what were the keys culture-wise to creating success? You know, seeing employees come in and wash out, what are the ones that made it? You know, give me some of the, the big picture takeaways from that journey. I mean, yeah, there's a lot, you know, because going through all those different stages of the growth of the business, you run into so many break points. It's one of the reasons why we started Cardone Ventures so that we can help businesses navigate through these break points as they're scaling. Uh, because, you know, in the very beginning, production is like the, the most important thing. Like you have to, you have to put deals on the board and then it's, then it's a, uh, uh, training a team. And then once you start building people and getting employees, then you have to start like really getting clear on what you want the culture of the business to be. And, and what are you going to do to make sure that that culture is duplicated in the business? And then as you grow in scale, you got to support clients in a different way. And so there's so many different things, but if you just go back to a uh, clear vision, purpose, and mission of the company and, 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 and like non-negotiables uh, uh, in your, in your company culture, and creating an opportunity and showing and demonstrating to people the opportunity that exists uh, within your organization. And if you can do those things, then you build a really solid foundation. Um, people come and work here because I can tell a sales guy, look, you're gonna make three grand a month as a base salary. Every, every other penny you make will be commission, but walk back here and let me show you a couple guys that are making 600, 700 grand a year. Hey. Uh, Bonnet, pull out your W-2 and then show them the W-2 and how much money they're making. So when you can, when you can show people the opportunity and, and, a, and, and they can see it and they can feel it and you're not trying to sell somebody on the hype like, oh man, you could make, you could make five, 600 grand here and then nobody's making that money. Um, we constantly show people uh, what is possible working here. So you have to be able to continue to sell people on the opportunity and the mission. What else are you guys um, selling a card on? Because that's a great thing when people when businesses start levering up, great opportunity because we have a lot of students in, in our community that are starting to scale up in multifamily. And there's those touch points when you have 50 units, it's different than having 500 units. So that's a great uh, product. Do you guys have any other programs or anything, anything else you'd like to talk or share with us? Yeah. Yeah. So Cardone Ventures is a, uh, is a company that we set up with a partner of ours. His name's Brandon Dawson. And the, the purpose of, of Cardone Ventures is, uh, Brandon was involved. Uh, he's a private equity guy. He was involved in a couple roll-ups and, and did, did one in the audiology space and ended up helping a lot of business owners get valuations and get money for their business that they couldn't have on their own because he helped them install processes and systems that allow their business to scale beyond their capacity or their capabilities. Mm -hmm. And so what we do is we look at businesses that are doing $3 million a year or more in sales and basically offer them a way for us to partner with them to help them navigate through those you know various growth stages uh to literally 10x their business if you're at three and you want to go to 30 if you're at 10 and you want to go to 100 then we can help put the systems and processes in place in your business to do it that's awesome any any other uh programs anything else that you want to focus on with us yeah i mean cardone university obviously like that's our our core product that's the thing that like i cut my teeth on so uh, i believe that everybody uh everybody who everybody who wants to take true control of their ability to earn and this isn't just a sales thing it's a life thing like if you can figure out how to get what you want out of life um you will live with intention, you will live with purpose, and you will be empowered because you feel the confidence of control in your life and where you're going. And Cardone University, hands down, is the best thing that I've come across in my life to do it. And I, my, my, 
my passion and conviction about it is because I'm a product of it. I came in making 2,500 bucks a month and now I've got millions invested in real estate. And I, I mean, my life is in a place that, uh, you know, I, I didn't think it, I didn't think it was possible to get to. I thought that was like the athlete lifestyle or the celebrity thing. Um, but there are a lot of people in business that make a lot more money than athletes and actors and all that stuff. Uh, if you just have the right information. So Cardone University, Cardone Ventures, and of course, Cardone Capital, you know, these are, we tried to, we tried to basically lay the company out so that we could provide an ecosystem for people to come in with very little information about sales, business, personal finance, investing, things like that, and provide them a track where we can help educate them along the way and then give them the option to either go do it on their own or do it with us. And, um, and so you guys have, are seeing kind of the, the culmination of all those things come together and we're really getting the, the foundation laid. And so I think over the next two years, you're going to see some big things coming from, uh, from our, from our camp. At what age did you start investing alongside grant and real estate? And what about that opportunity excited you versus putting your money in other asset classes or vehicles? Yeah. So, so one of the best things that happened to me was also one of the worst things that happened to me. Making money at a young age was great. Uh, and I'm not talking millions, but you know, I, I was making 200 grand a year and I had no bills. Like, like it was, that's a lot of money when you're 21. Um, but I lost it all. So great experience was I got to make a lot of money. Bad experience was I lost everything and was at a really low point. So I knew for sure that I never, ever, ever wanted to go back to how I felt living in my buddy's house, not paying rent, feeling like a bum. And when I started working for Grant, and I started learning from him and I started watching him. I mean, success leaves clues. If you want to figure out what successful people do to be successful, just watch how they operate, how they connect, how they engage, how, you know, be, be a student, be aware enough to, to watch the things that they do. And so when Grant was invested in all this real estate, I was like, hey, you know, how, how do I get involved? And this was way before the funds. Um, he's like, well, if you can get a hundred grand saved up, I'll let you invest in one of the deals with me. And so I busted my ass. I was making 12 grand a month and I was still sleeping on an air mattress cause I was saving every penny that I had to put into this first real estate deal. And, uh, ever since then I've just committed long-term that investing in multifamily is going to be, uh, like it's, it's something that is, uh, 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 it's just, that's just what I do. And I, I don't look at the short term, I'm looking big picture and just know that, hey, if I continue to do this over a long period of time, I'm going to turn around one day and it's going to be really big. That first hundred grand, uh, that first hundred grand that I invested has paid me a thousand dollars a month for the last six years. Uh, we refinanced it twice and I was able to pull out another 300K on that deal, still own the property, still get a thousand bucks a month on the deal. Uh, on that first hundred grand. And I've done that two or three other times with him. Last year, I made 800 grand tax free uh, based off the first three investments that I did. Um, and so it's just when you see the magic of real estate happen, you get in the right deals, uh, they're managed properly, and you give them time to do their thing. Uh, it, it, again, that requires that you're not short term focused and you're looking big picture. Uh, when you turn around, all of a sudden magic happens and you're just like, where'd that come from? And uh, so, so uh, you know, for people who are, you know, investing on their own, great, awesome for you. Uh, if you're like me and you have to be 100% all in on your main thing and, um, and you want to do it with somebody else, Cardone Capital, I can't speak highly enough about what it's done for me and my family. So I have a couple, I guess the follow-up question is, you've laid out beautifully why for you, but why multifamily in specifically, why can I go buy a single family home or another asset class? Why did you like multifamily specifically? Uh, because of the scale and security that it provided, you know? Um, and that's not to say that, you know, people shouldn't go buy single family homes and flip them because for some people that's the only option that they have. And a lot of people get started like that, but there is, it's, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of uh, attention. I mean, when you're flipping houses or wholesaling deals or buying foreclosures, it's just a lot of work. And for me, it was like, okay, I can go, you know, if you're researching the deal on your own, you do the transaction once, you have a management company in place, and then the deal just works and operates. Uh, a tenant leaves, 
a tenant comes in, uh, cash flow dips a little bit, uh, four or five tenants leave, you still have, you're still profitable in the deal. So, um, it, the scale that it gives you, the security that it gives you, the way the banks look at the deal, they look at deals differently than they look at single family homes, uh, because it's, it's a cash producing business almost. Um, so for me, it, and you know, the fact that I know, uh, at 35 years old, I saw the cycle go through where, uh, everybody thought that the home thing was never going to stop. I, I was in the mortgage business actually in 2008, if you can imagine that. Um, and, and, and I was coming in on the tail end, like before everything was really like, before everything really blew up, but everybody inside the financial space uh, started seeing all the indicators and, and, and warning signs going off. I was still in the, in the subprime mortgage business at that point. Um, and I, I, dude, I don't know if I'll ever own a house again. <laughs> I mean, in, in the younger generation, like they're, you know, they, they don't want to commit. I'm, I'm looking at subscriptions for my car right now. Like, you know, uh, a, you get a new car every 60 days. Like the, the way the consumer acts and operates is changing. And I think the way that people are viewing home ownership, I mean, I, I'm trying to hire multiple six figure roles within my company right now. And I see unbelievably talented people that would crush it and kill it and make four or 500 grand a year, but they can't get past the fact that they own a house and they've lived in that town for 15 years and uh, this would require them to make a move and then they got to figure out how to sell the house and then oh my gosh and there's all these like it gives you the ability to be mobile and for people who like me who want to chase opportunity I think that rental is just the way that the way that I will continue to operate mm -hmm. I rent the house that I'm in now I own the apartments I rent the house that I'm in right now that's awesome I always tell my students uh, bet on the jockey and not on the horse uh, yeah. meaning that the sponsor in the deal is really important. Now you're fortunate to have Grant uh, be a sponsor on your deal. How would you tell our listeners, what are the things that you're looking for in a sponsor? Because it's really one thing. People think I'm just going to give somebody my money. Here's a hundred grand. It's all going to work for me. But the problem is you really have to know how to underwrite a deal. You have to understand the market. So I think getting educated is really important. Also, you have to know how to actually speak to investors and, and all that. What are you looking for in a sponsor? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I'm probably not the best person to ask for that because I haven't had to go through it. So like, I'd love to just tell you uh, exactly how I did it. But the way I did it was I found somebody who had the wherewithal. I found somebody who was knowledgeable. I found somebody that had a track record. I found somebody who was more invested in the deals than I was. Um, like I, I went, I, I went the grant way. So, you know, I would just say, make sure that those boxes are checked. Make sure they can demonstrate success. Make sure that uh, that they have a knowledge and understanding of it, and and you know, go from there. Uh, that's the short answer. The long answer would be to read the richest man in Babylon. Everything yeah. he said is basically distilled in a thirty-second soundbite right there. But yeah, you know, save ten percent of your income, which he was doing more than that. Find somebody who knows what they're doing. Don't uh, put your money with a shyster. You know, if you're going out there trying to buy jewels, don't go with the shield maker, basically. Go with the grant man, right? Yeah. He knows what he's doing. He's in apartments. So that's important. I mean, that's probably the biggest nugget other than the prospecting that I've taken from this, this uh, interview because it's, it's important. Sponsors are really important in real estate and just do your due diligence on sponsors. Vet them out and make sure because they're the ones who are going to be stewards of your money. We're all stewards of our own money. And once we realize that, it's going to be a lot harder to find somebody to give your money to. So um, let's take a quick break to hear from our sponsors. Gino, I know a lot of our listeners are wanting to take their multifamily investing business to the next level. I know that you've been hard at work helping Jake and Gino students do just that using our framework. Can you explain to the listeners how they can get our help? Guys, we've been hard at work growing our community of like-minded investors and the results of our members has been nothing short of incredible. We're looking to grow this amazing group. What we're looking for is those who want to follow our proprietary framework that we've created. Buy right, manage right, and finance right. Leverage our connections, education, and mentorship as ways to take your business to the next level. So if you're interested in finding out more about how you can become a part of our amazing community, apply to work with us at jakeandgino.com forward slash apply. Gino, I'm going to let you take the short answer questions this time. But before we dive into those, Jared, I have one more topic I want to kind of dive in with you. Yeah. So you mentioned the culture, right? And the keys to growing it. We are a growing organization as, you, as we speak. Um, what, what are some of the keys to scaling that culture? What is the culture you want? And you mentioned non-negotiables. 
mention what are those and how do you enforce them? What does that look like? Yeah, so we have like uh, the way our day looks for our sales team is they come in at 820. Uh, they've already done a sales training assignment on their own in the morning on the way to work while they're getting ready at the house while they're eating breakfast, whatever. Uh, they, they have already done training on their own from Cardone University. 8.20 to 8.30, they do a quick 10-minute meetup where they chat about what they discussed or what the, the assignment that they uh, were, were given the previous day for the morning. And then they break off and they role play for 25 minutes until 9.05 when we do our all-hands office meeting. We share success stories from every department. It's always positive. We share numbers, we share stats, and we share updates on where the company's going. We do that every single day without fail. Uh, it, it is not an option to come to those meetings. It is not an option to participate in those things. You do those things, uh, you either show up, you miss it because you're pitching a deal, or you miss it because you have a bad attitude, and if that's the case, then we fire you. Um, you know, throughout our office, we have signs all over the office, these little grant-isms uh, that talk about the positive things that we're doing and the positive things that we do to impact uh, uh, the public. Um, you know, we're constantly talking about the future. So these are, these are all things that like, so non-negotiables, let me just answer this. Uh, never be late, like ever. You get, you get like one, one chance at this. If you can't show up and be on time for work, then you don't belong here. Uh, dress for, uh, dress for success. So, uh, salespeople always suited up, buttoned up. Uh, you know, we always, 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 we have like sales practices. Then we'll go into non-negotiables. We always give a price on the phone. We always send a customer a contract. Um, and then we always follow up. Like those are like core foundational elements of who we are as a company. Uh, because those are all things that are important to grant. Uh, phone rings twice. It always, it gets answered on the third one. If it rings twice, it's for you, uh, it, it kind of policy. So, um, you know, but your, your company has to, 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 to figure out, like some people would watch our morning meeting and go, wow, that's way over the top because it doesn't fit their culture. Um, you need to come up with those, those things for you that you, at this point in your organization, you decide this is what we want the experience to be like with our customers. This is we want the experience to be like from an existing employee. What if, if somebody works here, what do we want them to say about us when they're with their friends and family? You know, and how do you want to be viewed as a leader within that company? You know, these are, these are all the questions that you need to, 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 to come up with answers to, and that becomes your culture. What do you want to be remembered for? How do you want your customers to view you? Um, perspective. Uh, these, these are all the things that you want to make sure. Those, that is what your culture will determine. Your culture will determine how your people feel, how your customers feel, how the public views you, how people view you as a leader. Uh, those are all born from the, the things that you install for you. I like that. I like culture. I, I always thought culture was poo poo until we started Jake and Gene. And I'm like, wow, culture is everything. You, you attract yeah. not what you are, not what you want, but what you are. So you got to be careful of what you are. Cause if you're crap, you're going to attract crap. So you better, better, better level up. Treat um, people like crap. That, that's what you're going to get back. You know, you, you, it's just, it's so simple. It's just like, do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Treat people the right way. Uh, it's, it's not complicated, but you'd be surprised that the easiest things to do are the easiest things not to do, right? <laughs> I agree. What is your uh, best habit for success? Uh, goals, goal focused, extremely goal focused. Remind myself of my goals all my time. Like write my goals down every single day, at least once a month, depending on where I'm at mentally, because everybody's a little crazy. Uh, depending on where I'm at mentally, I may go weekly on a deep dive for goals. Um, but, but really digging into where do I want to be 10 years, 15 years from now, if everything were perfect, like if I'm 50 years old and I could just do whatever I wanted to do, have the life that I wanted to live, you know, without, you know, I've got, I'm a billionaire, I've got seven jets, you know, like without getting too, uh, uh, romantic about it. Uh, Figuring out like what that life looks like, how much it's going to cost and, and how to get there. Like literally just reverse engineering it. If, if I'm at 50 years old and I want to make a million bucks a year passive or 2 million bucks a year passive or whatever, like what, what do I need to do now to get myself in a position where that is my reality 
And, 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 and really this is important because most people are disconnected with their dream life, their ideal life, and how much that actually costs. And so if you spend enough time drilling down and figuring out what you want your life to look like, and you really dig down how much that will cost, it will allow you to put a plan in place that will move you towards that uh, with the right expectations. Oftentimes what I see happen is when I sit down with people and I say, hey, look, if everything were, you know, you're 15 years down the road, if everything were perfect for you, what would it look like? And I say, how much money do you think you'd need to, to, to facilitate that lifestyle? 99% of the time, they're off, majorly. So imagine this, imagine you have a 15 year plan, you're halfway into it, and then you realize, shit, I had the math wrong the whole time. I was operating with the wrong information, I wasn't doing hard, I, I should have done this, I should have done that, and then you end up with a defeat and a big L because now you have to confront the fact that you have half the time to do the same amount of work. So getting really focused, not only just having your focus and attention on your goals and what you're doing, but how to actually get closer to them today and making sure that you're connecting the cost with, with what is real in life. Book, any kind of books that you want to recommend? I know you must be an avid book reader there. Uh, I don't read as much as I should. Uh, I'm terrible. I hate reading. It's, <laughs> it's, uh, really? You know, the, the, problem is, the, the problem is because I, I, uh, I, I have to read a book like three times before I understand it. Like, well, I, no, I just, everyone has to read a book. Yeah. That's the problem. Most of us know yeah. can do. They've got to really do that space repetition. That's why you're probably a video guy and you like to go back and watch the video again, take some notes and really digest I, it. I have to do it all three ways. Like I have to be able to watch something about it. I have to be able to read it. I have to be able to listen to it because you, you know, you pick up different things each yes. way, but, but, um, I don't read as much as I should. I'm trying to get through principles right now by Ray Dalio. And I'm just like, all oh, it's, you know, dude, it's painful. It's a long book, right? Yeah. I mean, it yeah. is a, it's a hard, I mean, I try to listen to it on audible. I wanted to really, I don't want, I want to shoot myself. I'm like, I don't know how my partner listened to this thing. And he raves about it. I'm yeah. like, dude, this is some, well, some people think like that, you know, like, so, so then the, the way people communicate sometimes, like, that's why I think it was so easy for me with Grant is because he just communicated in a way that was really easy for me to actually like set myself in and be like, okay, I can hear him talking to me and he's communicating it how I need to hear it. And it, that happened like the first time I read one of his books. And that's why I was like, oh my gosh, this is like, this is it. Um, but you know, uh, let's see, last, last book before that, that I read that, uh, that I loved. Um, you know, uh, outliers delivering happiness, you, you know, like this kind the, uh, purple cow, uh, the, uh, Gary Vee's, you know, like I just, all this, all the normal books that, that, that are on the, uh, the, the, the circuit, mm -hmm. uh, you, you end up reading everybody's book. Um, paradox of choice, but you know, I was trying to figure out, like I had trouble figuring out how that really, I couldn't make a real strong connection with how that really worked in our business. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you just got to pick stuff up. And as long as you can, as long as you can read stuff and know that you're, you know, you're, for me, I, I don't like most books that I read, you know, but I'm always looking at it through the lens of, uh, I just read on the, on, on Australia flight, uh, Deepak Chopra's books for, um, for parents, mm -hmm. uh, seven principles for, uh, spiritual principles for parenting. Um, you know, it, 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 books, it, it's, I, it's so painful for me to read books, but every time I do, I, I'm like, okay, that was good. I need to figure out how to do this again. <laughs> it's like going to the gym. Like I, you know, I actually enjoy going to the gym now, but sometimes I think about the gym and I'm just like, Oh God, I do not want to go. Then you feel good after you do it. <laughs> That's awesome. How can the listeners get a hold of you? Uh, just at Jared Glant on any social. I'm really active on Instagram. J A R R O. You'll probably have my name on here somewhere. J A R R O D G L A N D T. If I ever reach out to you via Instagram or Facebook, trying to sell you crypto or Forex scam, don't do it. Uh, don't give them any money. I'm not a Bitcoin guy. So people create fake profiles and, and, uh, and, <laughs> and do all that. It's not me. 
He's not in Bitcoin yet. Give him some yeah. time. He'll be in Bitcoin yeah. yet. Mr. Rusin, wrap it up for me, brother. <clears throat> All right, guys. I want to thank Jared for being an amazing guest on the show and sharing his Movers and Shakers story. Guys, if you want to be the next Movers and Shakers guest, email me, josh at jakeandgino.com. Now, if you enjoyed the show, please leave us a review. And until next time, let's make it a Movers and Shakers week. See you, everybody. Thanks.